What if I told you there's a way to reduce crime, help victims heal, and even stop offenders from re-offending, yet it's often overlooked in our justice system? Instead of just locking people up and hoping for the best, what if we actually tackled the root of the problem? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're exploring restorative justice. Before we dive in, if you're looking to take your understanding of psychology you to the next level, be sure to check out our membership site. We have loads of resources including exemplar essays that can help you master key concepts and help boost your grades. Check it out in the description below. Restorative justice is a method of reducing and atoning for offending behaviour through reconciliation between the offender and the victim, as well as the wider community. It's a powerful approach to dealing with crime that focuses on repairing harm rather than just punishing the offender. Unlike custodial sentencing, which often emphasises punishment and isolation, restorative justice focuses on reconciliation, accountability and healing. Without it, many offenders leave prison unchanged and victims are left feeling unheard. Restorative justice has three key aims. First, the rehabilitation of offenders, helping them understand the true impact of their actions and commit to meaningful change. Second, the atonement for wrongdoing, encouraging offenders to truly take responsibility, not just deal with legal consequences. And finally, considering the victim's perspective, giving them a voice in the process, a chance to express their feelings and an opportunity to find closure. At the heart of this process is the restorative meeting, a structured but deeply meaningful conversation. Here's how it works. A trained mediator brings together the victim and the offender in a supervised setting to help ensure they both engage in a meaningful and constructive conversation. The process begins with the offender acknowledging their guilt and taking full responsibility for their actions. This admission is crucial as it demonstrates accountability and their willingness to make things right. The victim then shares their experience, giving the offender a direct and often emotional understanding of the harm they have caused. This forces the offender to confront the human cost of their crime, not just in the eyes of the law, but on a human level. This helps develop empathy and reflection. This moment is often a turning point, allowing the offender to try truly understand the harm they've caused. However, acknowledging harm is only the first step. Restorative justice requires tangible action. The victim has the opportunity to express their needs, whether that be a sincere apology, financial payment for loss or damages, or another form of making amends for the wrong they have done. This step makes justice feel personal and meaningful rather than just a legal process. After the meeting, an agreed upon plan is put into place to ensure accountability. In some cases, offenders may also be required to attend therapy, addiction treatment or educational programs to address the root causes of their behaviour and reduce the risk of re-offending. By implementing these measures, restorative justice moves beyond words and toward genuine rehabilitation and resolution. Sounds great, right? But does it actually work? Sherman and Strang in 2007 conducted a meta-analysis into restorative justice. This means they conducted a review of existing research into restorative justice. They combined data from 36 studies that evaluated the effectiveness of restorative justice programs. These studies were carried out in a variety of countries, providing a broad international perspective on restorative justice practices. What did their research find about restorative justice? Three things. A reduction in recidivism. One of the central findings of the study was that restorative justice programs are generally effective in reducing re-offending, particularly for serious offenders. Victim satisfaction. The study found that victims involved in restorative justice processes reported higher levels of satisfaction than those who went through traditional criminal justice procedures. Offender accountability. Offenders were more likely to take responsibility for their actions and 
unexpressed remorse compared to offenders processed through the conventional criminal justice system. This research suggests that it works, and works in ways that custodial sentencing and behaviour modification do not. Restorative justice programmes are often praised for their potential to create long-term changes in offenders and reduce recidivism rates. Directly involving offenders in face-to-face -face dialogue with victims can lead to stronger motivations for personal change and a commitment to not re-offend. Additionally, restorative justice offers support through counselling, education or community involvement which helps address the underlying causes of criminal behaviour. Some have argued that restorative justice helps break the cycle of reoffending by providing a more meaningful path to reintegration into society. One of the main criticisms of restorative justice is that they are often done in different ways using various methods. This inconsistency can lead to different results and make the programmes less effective. Some mediators may not have enough training, which can cause them to handle sensitive situations poorly, potentially harming the participants and lowering the programme's trustworthiness. Because of this lack of standardisation, it's hard to say for sure how effective restorative justice actually is. Another criticism relates to how widely it can be used. On the one hand, restorative justice can be and has been used for a range of different crimes. However, it may be less effective or appropriate with very serious crimes such as murder or sexual assault. This is because the victim may find confronting the offender a highly traumatic experience and could potentially make the situation worse. Additionally, it may not be suitable for all criminals. This is because there is always the risk of offender manipulation. Some criminals may agree to participate in a restorative justice session simply to receive a more lenient sentence without genuinely engaging in the process or taking responsibility for their actions. Furthermore, restorative justice programmes can be criticised for requiring significant levels of motivation from both the victim and the offender, which can limit their effectiveness. For offenders, the process demands a willingness to take responsibility for their actions, acknowledge harm, and engage in meaningful dialogue with the victim, something that may be challenging for those who are not ready to face the consequences of their behaviour, or who may not not fully understand the impact of their actions. Similarly, victims must have the emotional readiness to confront their offender and participate in a process that could reopen emotional wounds. This can be particularly difficult for victims who may feel anger, fear or distrust toward the offender. In both cases, the success of restorative justice hinges on the personal motivation of the individuals involved, and if either party is unwilling or unprepared to engage fully, the process may fail to achieve its intended outcomes of healing and accountability. And one last bonus point to take your understanding to the next level. Now that we have covered behaviour modification, anger management and restorative justice as ways of dealing with offending, we can compare how similar and different they are. This provides us with an even more effective way of evaluating and prepares you for a comparison question in the exam. I've put all of that in a table for you, which you can download a copy of using the link in the description below. For more resources to help you master psychology don't forget to check out the bear it in mind website and i hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you in the next one